Hello, this is Professor John Baugh, and this is your first lecture of uh, CIS 2555. It's a late start course. Um, there were some, uh, there was a cancellation originally, as most of you know, and uh, then there were some uh, complaints, and uh, we, the administration realized that it was needed for um, some degree programs, so we re-ran it. So hopefully you've got in and everything's uh, everything's going well for you so far, but this is the first week. Um, I will post lectures, video lectures, um, essentially every week. Sometimes it'll just maybe j just be materials, but I will frequently post video lectures as well to help you understand the material better. Um, we'll go over the syllabus first, um, which is uploaded under Desire to Learn. Everything we do will be through Desire to Learn. So, um, it's CIS 2555 Web System Development with ASP.NET. Um, Oakland Community College. I'm I'm located on the Orchard Ridge campus, um, and it's winter 2015. Uh, since this is online, we will only actually have one in-person meeting. It'll probably be for the midterm, unless you visit me during office hours. That's also uh, acceptable, obviously. Um, the when and the where are online. So the material will be uploaded weekly, usually by mo about Monday or Tuesday. Uh, but worst case scenario, by Friday, if there is any kind of problem. Uh, and I will accommodate and figure that in, to. Uh, due dates and things like that if I have to modify them. So, um, My name's uh, John P. Baugh. If you've had me for a class before, you're familiar with me already. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I have uh, a master's degree in computer science from the University of Michigan Dearborn, and I am currently working on a PhD in information systems engineering as well. I uh, worked for Siemens PLM Software after I got my master's degree. Uh, during my master's training I was working actually as a researcher at U of M and then when I got my master's degree I went on to uh, Siemens PLM Software in Ann Arbor. It used to be a company called UGS but they were purchased by uh, Siemens, the global conglomerate. Um, and I worked in the, uh, licensing and business intelligence so I helped write a lot of the software that had to do with um, making sure that the other software was secure from uh, piracy. So after that, after working there about five years as a software engineer full-time, I um, was offered this opportunity to uh, get the position at Orchard Ridge. So I tried out for that and uh, they whittled down their 100 applicants down to 12, interviewed us, and then whittled that down to three, and then uh, voila, I'm here. So three and a half years later, I'm the chairman of the department at the Orchard Ridge campus, and uh, it's been it's been a wild ride. I really, really enjoy it, though. So if you do need to visit me, uh, my room is uh, F117 on the Orchard Ridge campus. My office hours, I'm typically in during the mornings on Tuesday and Wednesday from 825 to 8.55, so about a half hour. Might run a couple minutes late there. Let me know if you're coming so I can make sure that I'm uh, there. We'll arrange something, because sometimes I do have meetings at random times also. Um, I'm also there 1.30 to 5.30 on Tuesdays, so I have kind of a large uh, four-hour office hour there on Tuesdays between a couple of the classes I teach. Uh, Wednesdays, unfortunately, besides this, I don't have office hours. Uh, Thursdays, I'm uh, typically, although there, this, there's a lot of meetings on Thursdays, so definitely check with me before you come in, but I will typically be there from 9.30 to 10.30, sometimes 10 to 11. It kind of depends on what's going on. Um, this upcoming Thursday, I have a meeting, uh, so I will not be here for regular office hours. I'll be out in Auburn Hills at a meeting, so uh, 2 to 3, I have online office hours on Thursdays, and the office hours are subject to change, especially being uh, chairman, I do end up in a lot of meetings and, you know, stuff happens, so I will work out stuff for you and make sure that, you know, you're able to um, get the contact with me or with a tutor that you need. Um, the email that you can reach me at is jpbaugh at oaklandcc.edu, and the objectives of this course are... Um, this class, uh, the objectives that are, the official objectives that are on the website are actually incorrect. 
Um, I, I think they'll be fixed by the time they roll out the new website, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, the course objectives from the website are actually outdated significantly, um, so I, I kind of changed this slightly. Um, this course focuses on client and server side scripting using C Sharp or Visual Basic. The course will introduce ASP.NET, specifically this semester we're working with 4.5 and uh, work with the ASP object model. The use of stored procedures against an SQL server database is also introduced. Students will be required to complete um, computer-based assignments inside and outside of class. So, a um, couple things is I'm using Camtasia to record this. This is typically what the instructors use uh, when they record it. So if you see me opening up the Camtasia uh, some of the Camtasia stuff is just to see uh, how I'm running on uh, time and also occasionally I might have to pause uh, to get some materials ready or do something like that so don't let that uh, you probably won't notice how long I've paused <laughs> unless you look at the system clock um, but other than that um, that's just to give you a heads up on what's going on so um, I am going to be using C Sharp for this course. I know the original instructor was using Visual Basic and the, the full-time instructor that has retired recently um, out in Auburn Hills uh, used Visual Basic for years for this course. I personally think C Sharp is more expressive. It's a generally uh, better language. It's specifically designed for the .NET framework, so I think it flows more naturally. Um, however, if you decide you don't want to get the C Sharp book or you're just too uncomfortable with C Sharp, um, or get the ASP book with C Sharp, or you're just too uncomfortable with C Sharp, or you just prefer Visual Basic, you're like a, maybe you're just a really, really good Visual Basic programmer, and you want to write your assignments in Visual Basic, I will accept them as long as they work. I know Visual Basic also, so I can see whether they're working or not, and give you code suggestions and things like that. However, my materials will focus on C Sharp. It's just a heads up. Prerequisite students should have a basic knowledge of internet technologies before enrolling in this course. Um, I also make an assumption that you you have some sort of uh, programming under your belt. Um, I assume that people taking this course have at least um, the Java 1. Uh, probably a lot of you have Java 1, Java 2. Some of you might have C++. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as you have a programming language, a little bit of programming experience under your belt. If you don't, you're going to have to play a lot of catch-up. Um, so you're going to have to maybe get a book on C Sharp. There is a book by Muroc just on C Sharp called Muroc C Sharp 2012 by um, Joel Muroc and Anne Bohm. Um, I would recommend that book if you want to have a companion guide. And the Muroc books Compared to a lot of textbooks, Muroc books are actually really reasonable. Um, the C Sharp book is $55. The ASP.NET book is uh, like $57, $58, I think, is the retail price. Um, so compared to a lot of textbooks, they're really, really cheap. Um, some books, like for the C Sharp course currently, the book that I'm using for actually $27.57, is like 120 bucks, and some and the Visual Basic books the same, the Gaddis books. Those tend to be very expensive, but the Murak books are actually very, very well done, and they tend to be a lot uh, less expensive. So, um, if you do want that, if you have a, a little extra money lying around and you want to purchase a book on C Sharp, I would highly recommend Murak. But there are a lot of good books out there. Um, I will provide a, a brief introduction as your first. Um, lecture, the material for today, I will provide you with uh, the basics of C Sharp that you'll need and as we as we go along I will explain C Sharp uh, syntax throughout the course. So I'll give you exactly what you need, but it is not a full treatment of C Sharp um, like you would get in 2757 which I'm also teaching this semester. So the uh, textbook for the course is Mirax ASP.NET 4.5 Web Programming with C Sharp 2012. Um, one second. Uh, give me a, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay. So it's by Mary uh, Delameter and Ann Bohm. The ISBN is written here. It's uh, 978 1 890774-75 2 and the topics covered for the course. I'll do a review of C-sharp programming and concepts. I will um, discuss web servers and web applications in a future, future lectures. 
Introduction to ASP.NET Programming, Developing Multi-Page Web Applications, because uh, initially we'll focus on just some of the basic, uh, the fundamental um, single-page applications, and we'll go into multi-page uh, page web applications, testing and debugging, server controls, state cookies and URL encoding, and an introduction to database programming. So, um, we will deal with a little bit of uh, SQL or SQL and uh, how to interact with databases using ASP uh, framework. So, website, everything we do will be through um, desire to learn. So, currently, until the new website gets rolled out, there will be a new website allegedly that's supposed to be rolled out, I think, near the middle or end of February. You go to oaklandcc.edu and click on distance learning, and then you will be able to log in to desire to learn. This will include PowerPoint slides, class and out announcements, course syllabus, test dates, handouts, and other information. Um, you're all required to have an email account. If you are registered with uh, OCC, then you should have an email account. Um, I typically try to answer my email uh, quite frequently. If we do have to work out a face-to-face -face or um, even an online screen share, we can work out stuff, so just um, let me know what's going on and we will try to I'll try to work it out for you uh, for grading and evaluation uh, normally I do four programming projects in total uh, this time we're gonna do three because it's a, a shortened course uh, but I will try to add enough complexity that you you know learn as much as you can from this course it'll be still full coverage of material I'm just putting a little less burden on you as far as the actual assignments you'll get you have Programming Project 1, which is worth 100 points. Programming Project 2 is 125. And then you have a Capstone Project, um, which is the culmination of your efforts for this course. That will be 200 points. The midterm examination is worth as much as the first programming assignment. It's uh, 100 points. And then you'll have other optional homework, and that varies. Um, I may assign an optional homework assignment, I may not. It kind of depends on how the course goes, what kind of que kinds of questions I get over email with certain frequency. If I decide, hey, you know, no one's or everyone's misunderstanding this concept, I may do a mini lecture on it, an additional mini lecture and record that, or put supplemental materials, or give you a, a supplemental assignment. They will be usually quite short though, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I, I may not give you an assignment either. I may just do a supplemental material, but this is just there. It'll be for your benefit. The homework will usually probably be around 10 points, 15, maybe 20 at most. Um, this is my grading scale. It's pretty standard. 95 to 100 percent is an A, 90 to 94 is an A minus, etc., etc., all the way down to F. You don't want to shoot for anything in this range, and as long as you turn in your assignments and do your work and actually uh, put effort forward, you should do okay. I can't promise you an A unless you do really well, but I will promise you that if you actually do your assignments and you keep up on the material, um, you turn in stuff, You it's very unlikely you will get anything below the C range. Alright, so projects and homework. I will assign three programming projects, sorry, missing S there, three programming projects including one capstone um, to grow your skill of programming as described earlier. Um, web development and problem solving. Additional homework may be assigned at my discretion. It may include questions, research, or small programming activities. Um, the homework and late penalties policy um, is, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but technically um, what I describe here is that if you uh, turn in an assignment late, I can take a 5% deduction off for every day that the assignment's late, that's in addition to whatever you have wrong in the assignment, if anything. Even if it's perfect, you will get 5% deduction for each day. After five business days, the assignment will no longer be accepted unless I prove such an exception. And I reserve the right to waive any penalties due to extenuating circumstances. So, um, I do encourage you to get everything done on time, but things do happen, and I will try to work with you as best as possible just, um, you know, I can tell when people are trying to play me, so don't, just don't mess with me and you'll be fine. 14-week um, tentative course outline. This is the full semester dates, okay? this The course did not start on the 12th, obviously, or even that week, and it goes until May 5th. The last day to drop the course is April 3rd, and these are the topics. 
this is the full schedule. Um, it, I will pretty much stay uh, true to the schedule unless we have um, you know extenuating circumstances. Since this is an online course, um, unless something major comes up, um, we don't have to worry about things like snow days and things like that because um, you should be able to watch it from um, watch it from home or watch it from um, another location sometime during the week if I post it fast enough so everything should be good the uh, <clears throat> the recordings generally will not last four hours that's uh, very unlikely uh, because I don't I don't have the questions back and forth and usually in my classes I let um, I leave some time near the end for questions and I dismiss earlier and then talk to the students that stay um, usually the people that are, you know, they're very comfortable with the material or they don't care will leave uh, leave early and um, that gives me more time to work with the students that, you know, have questions. So uh, the recordings will uh, sometimes run maybe 45 minutes, maybe they'll run an hour and a half, maybe they run two hours, it just kind of depends and sometimes there will be multiple recordings by topic. It depends on what will, uh, what goes on in the semester and um, based on your questions and things like that I will be able to determine what type of help you need. So this week being um, today is the 26th, the first week of material is the review of C-sharp. This is not in the book. Um, there may be some information in the append appendices, I can't remember, um, but this is not in the book. I will, I have made slides and uploaded them specifically designed to review C-sharp if you need a, if you want a more thorough treatment of C sharp I would highly recommend you take uh, 2757 um, otherwise get you know a supplemental book if you're just not comfortable with the syntax but if you've had any high-level programming language like uh, Java or C++ especially but even Visual Basic um, Visual Basic's a little different but if you have uh, had Java or C++ C sharp syntax should be na quite natural to you so there's no assignment this week um, then next week starting, uh, it's February 9th, the, um, we'll do an, it, that seems wrong, February 2nd. Oh, that's cute. I skipped a week. One second. Okay. All right. So there was a, there was a mistake on the syllabus that I found, um, and through the magic of technology, you now notice that the syllabus should be corrected. So the um, second, I was missing the second. I apologize for that. And also the, I noticed after a more thorough reading that the midwinter break was in the wrong location. So that kind of sucks. But anyway, I changed it to read 15-week tentative course outline, even though the last, the midwinter break doesn't really count as part of instruction. And the last day is just basically a due date. So I may or may not have any additional topics, but obviously since you don't have a final exam, um, you only have a midterm, you won't be responsible for it as far as like demonstration of the last couple weeks. Um, it's mostly wor uh, time to work on the capstone project. So um, I apologize for that. But anyway, the uh, first week, this week, we'll go over a review of C Sharp, and next week we'll do an introduction to ASP.NET and how to develop a one page web application, chapters one and two in the book. The following week, we'll uh, do a little bit of um, a little look into uh, HTML5 and CSS3. That'll be chapter three. Then the following week, we'll go into developing multi-page web applications. Then you will get your first programming assignment. It won't be due until March the 13th, so you get a couple weeks to work on that. And also, the March the 13th is a Friday, so you get uh, kind of as much time as possible during the during the week. Uh, March 13th, or during the work week at least, uh, March 13th, uh, 2015, at 11:59 p.m. The week after that is standard server controls. Then we have a midwinter break on March the second. Following that, um, we will do a uh, some work on chapter eight and also do a review for material for the midterm. The midterm is on the sixteenth. Okay, so just prepare ahead. The way we will work out the midterm for the online uh, students is I will um, very likely have a couple different sessions you can choose from on the Orchard Ridge campus. Um, if there is 
enough clamoring for a different time or a different location, we might be able to arrange that, depending. Um, if you absolutely cannot make any of the um, accommodated times um, and locations, then we will try to work out a proctoring situation where someone, say, at the testing center out in Auburn Hills will administer your test for you, um, uh, to you, and then they will send me the completed test. So for this week, I will, um, it's a little bit more laid back chapter, I suppose, and then review material for the midterm. I will tell you basically the material that will be on the midterm, and then uh, programming assignment two will be assigned uh, that day. Programming assignment three or for one is due that week, and also I want you to study, make sure you study for the midterm. Uh, programming assignment two is not due until April the 3rd. Okay, so you get a couple weeks on that. Programming assignment two is due the week of the 3rd. You get a little bit of a relaxation here because I don't assign the capstone until the following week on the uh, April the 6th. If we've gone over master pages, themes, and site navigation, and a little bit of an intro to uh, database programming, the capstone will likely have uh, something to do with data sources on it. Um, it's not guaranteed, but it probably will as it acts as a culmination of your material you've learned. Then we have a couple weeks of instruction uh, left on that grid view and different views that might be useful for you on the capstone. You are responsible for reading ahead um, if anything in the assignment is required, but you, there will be parts of the assignment you'll be able to kind of get a you know a grasp on initially and then as you learn the additional material you'll be able to add those and then the last two weeks are what I call instructors choice topics um, they may just be help for the capstone there may or may not be a video um, for that week or those weeks and then the last week it's actually due on the day of class so uh, make sure everything's in by May the 4th okay or 5th I don't know why that says, um, yeah, should be should be in by Tuesday, May the 5th. Okay, so it's due the day, the day right after the initial day of class, or the last day of class, essentially. So policy on computing resources, if you use the resources of Oakland Community College, um, then you need to make sure that you're using them for uh, legitimate purposes, and that you're abiding by applicable federal and state laws and the college's regulations okay there's a uh, if you want to see the full document just go to Oakland or oaklandcc.edu uh, and then uh, search for tower t-a-u-r t-a-u-r that is the a set of um, the um, policies on computing resources basically you know don't do anything stupid I mean obviously you aren't if you're on campus, if you're at home, you're kind of you can do whatever you want. It's on your home computer as long as you're abiding by law. But as far as policy is concerned, um, obviously don't use the school computers to look up things like pornography or contact, you know, drug dealers or anything that you shouldn't be doing anyway. But um, using the using the campus's resources um, and legal stuff obviously if you're doing anything to harass someone um, you know that's there's levels of laws that are against that too but even things like cyberbullying and stuff like that even though Michigan does not have an official law on cyberbullying it's still against the college's policy to use um, our resources so just be careful what you do um, and you should be okay policy on plagiarism and cheating don't cheat, don't plagiarize. Um, you should give credit to um, an originator. If you're doing, if I assign a research assignment, you should have like a bibliography or at least something short indicating that you got information from Wikipedia or something like that. But most of the assignments are um, individual programming assignments or uh, web development, web application development. So um, this may not be a problem. So as far as plagiarism. Cheating, um, I don't mind if students assist one another with concepts and maybe, okay, here's how you do this, but you should know that um, if two assignments look identical or nearly identical, um, then I'm going to be a little suspicious, especially the later assignments. Um, ADA notification, students requiring special assistance, including those affected by the Americans with Disabilities Act, should contact the Access Office and inform the instructor of any special conditions pertaining to their learning. 
Okay, so if you have any um, physical, behavioral, mental, emotional, or learning disabilities, you should contact AXIS and get registered with them officially, even if you, you think you might have a problem um, that you need assistance with you should uh, contact ACCESS. FERPA is the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. This just means that I can't share your information with anyone, including parents or relatives. So even if your parent is paying, <clears throat> excuse me, even if your parent is paying for your um, uh, college education, I cannot share your attendance or you know how you're doing in the course, etc without your prior written consent. So, um, other things, if you need to show them your grades or what have you, you will have desire to learn and that is what you will log into to show them your grades. All right. Um, this is going to keep popping up, isn't it? Uh, don't show this message again. There we go. Perfect. Um, tutors, there are tutors available in the CIS Labs and F building. Make use of them. And the disclaimer is that I can modify the syllabus if I need to, if I feel like you have to, um, if you have to do something, uh, or if I have to do something to make it m better for your learning experience, then I will modify the syllabus. So, um, if there are any questions, please email me about the syllabus, and we'll jump right into uh, the first lecture. So, just enough C-sharp. Um, this is, just gives you a very brief overview of C Sharp in order to get uh, Visual Studio, which you will need for the course, Visual Studio Professional. It's 2012 version. Notice Professional 2012. No, don't use 2013. No, don't use 2010. No, don't use 2007, 2005, 2003. You have to have Professional 2012. Ultimate 2012 will also work, um, but just you know, be a little bit uh, reasonable. As long as it's 2012, you should be okay. You could probably get away even with the Express Edition that you can download for uh, free with no problem from Microsoft's website. But I have added all the students in the course to DreamSpark, which means you can go to DreamSpark. Uh, you should have gotten an email of some sort to your official OCC email, student OCC email. Um, and it shows you how to register. You register, log in, <clears throat> download it, and then you will download an, a .iso file, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, and then you'll be able to install Visual Studio. Once you get Visual Studio installed, this is the environment we will be using. So, for ASP and for even the C Sharp review. So, um, this course is not an exhaustive coverage of C Sharp programming. For a more thorough look at C Sharp, as I mentioned before, you want to go uh, take CIS 2757. However, you need some C Sharp to work with ASP.NET. You could also use Visual Basic. Um, I will use C Sharp for most examples. You're free to use Visual Basic, but I recommend using C Sharp. The coverage of the material will flow better for you. You need at least the express version of Visual C Sharp 2012, but I recommend, again, downloading Visual Studio 2012 Professional, not 2013, not 2010, not 2015 beta, none of that stuff, 2012, there are differences. Go to dreamspark.com, go to the academic, I think it says academic access or academic subscriptions, search for Oakland Community College, then you can log in. Um, I think I already added a direct link to on the hub which is the host for DreamSpark. Um, I think the direct link will go straight there so you can just log in. You download the ISO file after you go through some of their gobbledygook. Um, you will get the Visual Studio 2012 professional ISO file. You cannot just double click on the ISO and have it install. An ISO is a disk image file so you have two options. You, if you have a, C, a DVD burner, I recommend doing this one. Take a DVD, pop, or get a couple blank DVDs, pop the blank DVD into the drive, right-click the ISO, and if you have burning software, which you should, um, there should be an option that says burn to disk, um, as, dis, as disk image or something to that effect. Um, you will burn it to the DVD, wait on it, and then that's basically this essentially, and for the most part, the same thing that a manufacturer would do if they were installing uh, the stuff onto a DVD that you would purchase at, say, Best Buy or Staples or whatever. Um, they burn all the software onto the DVD. You're going to burn it. 
and then you just pop the DVD out after it's done burning and then pop it back in as if you just went to Best Buy and purchased the disc and then just got done with opening the packaging and you were bushy-tailed and bright-eyed and excited to install your new software, pop that DVD back in and it will bring up an installer at that point. That may seem like it's a little bit of a strange way to go, but um, for the amount of work versus the amount that it would cost you to purchase Visual Studio 2012 Professional, it's definitely worth it. So, the other option, if you do not have a DVD burner or just choose not to purchase one or purchase a DVD, or you're just you don't want to get everything done directly, um, search Google for install from IS ISO and download a program to help you. There are various programs, uh, Demon Tools is one of them, there's a couple that basically you just say you pick the ISO file that's special software that can read it and you can install directly from it without the intermediate use of a DVD. The only reason I recommend this one with the DVD if you have it and can do it is that you'll have a backup copy easily and readily available to you. All right. Um, also, I would get a couple different, a uh, couple DVDs because I don't remember if it takes up one or two. Um, you you should get two blank DVDs or more if you have um, an entire rack of them. That's fine too. Um, so what are we going to cover? Um, well, there's uh, data types and variables and some of the basic operations you can perform on them. Uh, we're going to focus specifically on numbers and strings for right now. Then we'll talk about control structures, methods, and event handlers, and then arrays. So, um, as most programming languages do, um, here, let me close this real quick. As most programming languages do, um, C Sharp has different data types. Okay, if it's a strongly typed language like C Sharp, Java, or C++, you will have strong data types. So a data type is, not surprisingly, the type of data that memory location holds. Uh, a variable is a named memory location, that's all it is. So when you create a variable in any programming language, you're going to basically give it a name, which is called the identifier, but you also have to d specify a type, which is the data type. What type of data does it hold? So here are some specific types of data, also known as data types. You've got integer, double, and string. These are three that we'll use a lot of. And here's what do they mean in the examples. An integer, just like in most languages you've dealt with, if you've dealt with another programming language, um, is a whole number, essentially counting numbers. So 0 would be an integer, 5 would be an integer, negative 30 would be an integer. However, negative 3.5 would not be an integer because it has a decimal point. So in, in, uh, integers are only the whole numbers and they're the counting numbers and their opposite, so whole numbers. An example, you would declare it in C Sharp such as this, and also this is doing the initialization or the assignment, initial assignment on one line. You can put int x equals 5 semicolon. You need the semicolons in C Sharp. So if you're coming from a language like Visual Basic where you just end the line then go to the next, keep this in mind. In Visual Basic it is a syntax error to put a semicolon. In most other high-level languages um, that are derived from uh, C languages or C++ languages like Java, C++, C Sharp, you have to have the semicolon. So now the variable x will contain the value 5. Again, this is a variable. It has a data type, int, and it has a uh, an identifier or name, x. It's just a named memory location. Okay. So once you run your program, this will have memory reserved for uh, enough memory to hold an integer right? Um, four bytes or what have you. Double um, is, are real numbers. They can contain decimals. So for example, I could put double y equals 5.5. .5. That contains 5.5 .5 now. The um, string data type um, in C Sharp, it will use a lowercase s, not an uppercase s like you would have in Java. So keep uh, make note of that. Characters, uh, character strings are things like words, sentences, and paragraphs. This would be an example. For this this one, you have string name equals, and then notice, unlike with integers and doubles, I have to put double quotes around it. Okay, so be very, very careful here. In the programming environment, you have to surround strings with double quotes. So now this variable name contains the string John. Alrighty. Next thing, 
are operators, operators on variables. So once you have these variables, you can perform a variety of operations on them. Many of these operations will be uh, arithmetic operations. So we have the standard arithmetic operators over here. These are called operators. And this gives you the name, what you call it. You don't just say plus sign. Usually in a programming language, you would say um, that's the addition operator. This is the subtraction operator, multiplication operator, division operator, uh, modulus operator. This is for remainder. There's also the elusive smooth operator. But anyway, um, example. So for the addition, you have 5 plus 6, x plus 2, 10 minus 5, 5 minus 2 with the subtraction operator. Multiplication, you have the asterisk. The asterisk, asterisk is formed by hitting the shift key and then uh, touching the 8, number 8, on most standard keyboards. The, um, uh, you also have it on the number pad as well. The division operator is a forward slash that does both integer and uh, floating point division, um, such as with doubles, real numbers. Then you have the modulus operator. That's for remainders. This gives you the remainder. So 10 modulus 2, what they're saying is how many times does, um, well, for, for division, you're saying how many times does 2 fit into uh, 10? That's the question you're asking because you want the quotient. So 10 divided by 2 is, not surprisingly, 5. 20 divided by 5 is, not surprisingly, 4 because 4 fives fit into 20 and uh, two fives fit into uh, 10. But with modulus, we're more concerned with the remainder. 10 modulus 2. First, you ask the division question. 10 divided by 2 is 5. Is there a remainder? There's no remainder for this one. So that means that the modulus, um, if I said 10 modulus 2, the remainder is 0. So 10 modulus 2 equals 0. Now, 7 modulus 3. How many times does 3 fit into 7? It fits in evenly twice. Now, if I take that, if I say 3 times 2, because it fits in 7 twice, that equals 6. Now, what's the difference between 7 and 6? There's a 1. There's a remainder of 1 left over. So that means the solution to this modulus problem right here is 1. Next, um, we're going to go over control structures. There are um, three control structure categories, or three control structures, essentially, in um, most imperative languages. Pretty much all imperative languages come to think of it. There's sequential control, selection control, and repetition control. We'll I'll look at each of these. So you've got um, sequential control. This is what you would normally write. The code is executed without branching or repeating, and the code is executed in sequence or linearly. This is why we call it sequential or linear control. So here's an example. I have, oops, I have um, int a equals 5, int b equals a plus 6, so b would then contain 11, and then you do a message box dot show the value of b is, and then you concatenate a b to the end. Um, just to show you, so you're familiar with Visual Studio's environment, for a standard C-sharp application, this will be different for ASP, but for a standard C-sharp application, you would go to Visual Studio. You can either click on New Project or go to File, New. Now, for right now, we'll do Project. Later, we'll do uh, Websites at different uh, times. But Projects encompass all the types of projects available in C-sharp. You got to make sure you're on the right language. That's very important because Visual Studio comes with multiple languages. So make sure the Visual C Sharp, if you don't see it up here as the primary language, look under other languages. You might see it there, depending on what your chosen language is. Um, let me change the location for it. Uh, here we go. I'm going to create a working directory here. Just put it somewhere useful. Um, always pick a location that is not. Uh, usually the default location is a bad idea. Um, you want to make sure that you keep it, uh, you know, what you're doing with it. And then you pick whatever type of op application you need. So we're going to go with a Windows Forms application just because it's straightforward. Um, we'll call this um, week one example. Make sure it says create directory for solution. Make sure it says C sharp here. Okay, it'll even say it in the little corner. Type visual C sharp. Hit OK. And it will create for you a Windows Forms application project. So 
here's a form. Um, if you do not see it, you should go to uh, View Toolbox, and then I usually drag the toolbox over here. Um, if it'll let me, it's initializing it. Give it a second, I guess. Do 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 do. Alrighty, give it just a second. Any day now. Any day now. Any day now. Hmm. Sorry about that. Took a couple seconds to... Uh, Camtasia is kind of a memory hog. I do have a lot of memory on this computer, but it is a memory hog. So, um, I did drag the toolbox over here. So, um, you can put all kinds of components onto the form that you're dealing with over here. Um, we're just going to put a button, because this is just for demonstrative purposes. And then with the form, you'll have similar similar interface in a lot of ways um, with ASP, but there are differences. Um, but buttons are a common control. And over here, you see the um, properties window down here. I'm going to change the text on it to click me. And I'm actually going to also change the name. So the name in Visual Studio, the name property here, I have it alphabetized, by the way, if you'll notice, alphabetical and category are the two different options. And I make sure it says properties and not events. So properties and alphabetical are picked here. The name of the button, I'm just going to call it uh, BTN Click Me. Um, you can name it pretty much anything useful. Any valid identifier is good. I'm going to then, to generate the event handler, you just double click the button and it generates the code, an empty code for the event handler. Now what that means is, um, when the, um, <clears throat> when the uh, button is clicked, it will execute whatever's in this event handler, which we'll talk about a little more formally in just a second, but um, this is an event handler. Okay, so an event handler is a method. This is a method, but it's a specific method that is wired in with a sender and the event argument. So you'll, you will experience similar things when we deal with ASP directly. But for now, just to do a demonstration, um, I have int A equals 5, int B equals A plus 6. So B equals 11 at this point. Then I'm going to do message box dot show. Say value of B is, and then I'm going to concatenate the B to the end here. Okay, we call this concatenation because we have a string, and then even though this is a different type, it's an integer, it will be um, uh, exp or implicitly <clears throat> coerced into a string because it's promoted to the most uh, complex value. Okay, or value that takes, yeah, typically the um, value that makes most sense. When you cast, when you have a string and you try to quote unquote add something to it, it will call the concatenation operator. So you've got the B here. If I run the application by building it, you go to build, build solution. That is equivalent to compiling. Okay, you build it and then go to debug, start without debugging. Unless you're doing a test, you want to start without debugging. So I've got this, I click it, and it says value of B is 11, which is exactly what it, we expect. So there's our static show method, we call that, it says value of B is whatever, in this case it's 11, and you're all set. So that's, that's good, we've demonstrated sequential control. There are other examples too, though, other types. You have selection control structures, these are the ones that often are called conditional or branching control. You might have something like an if statement right here. So if some value is true or if some value <clears throat> equals 5 or equals 6 or equals 7, then you would uh, execute it, otherwise do something else. So let's do this. Let's say um, if b is greater than 10, you want to do something, and then otherwise we'll do something else. Alright, so I'll do a message box dot show here. 
b is less than 10, or less than or equal to 10. Right? Otherwise, we'll say b is greater than 10. So these are the two options. You have an if, and then a condition. You're comparing two values. And then otherwise, you put an else. You execute the else. So it branches, it decides. So once I do this, and I click the button, it'll say b is greater than 10, because we know that the value of b is 11. Now what if we did this? If we said a plus 3 instead of a plus 6? All right. If I run that, say b is less than or equal to. So it falls into the different, the other block of code, right? So that's what an if statement, if else statements do. Um, the four primary formations of statements used in selection control are if, if else, chained or nested if else, where you have something like if, else, if, and then switch. Um, we're not going to focus really a lot on switch, but I will go over if, if else, and chained if else. We'll cover switch as needed. If statements by themselves are often called single selection uh, statements because you either do something or you don't. If else statements can provide alternatives, often called double selection statements, and can be chained to simulate multiple selection statements. So for example, I might say if something, if some value is equal to another, execute code block one. Otherwise, if you know this value falls in this range, do that. Otherwise, default, execute code block three. Switch statements, um, we won't you maybe not use a ton in the class, but this is just an example. These are naturally multiple selection statements. You switch on some variable, and if that variable is equal to 100, you do whatever's in here, and you have to put a break statement. It's a syntactic requirement in C-sharp, um, unless you have an empty case statement. For example, if the case 50 and 100 are the same, I could put um, case Sorry, right, one second. If I could put uh, case 50 right here, as long as that's empty, this will fall through to the next one. So if, the, if it's 50 or 100, um, it'll do whatever's in this part and then break. But otherwise, you need a break statement. If it's 200, do this. And then default is kind of like having a dangling else with no if. This is whatever the default behavior should be. You also need a break for that. Okay, so we've covered selection and sequential uh, control structures, and now we're going to cover repetition control structures. Repetition control structures, um, you've had uh, experience with before. Um, these are also called iterative or iteration control structures. With these repetition control statements, a block of code is repeated over and over again. Instead of just deciding to go to branch one way or the other, or just doing things in sequence, you're going to repeat a block of code over and over again based on uh, some condition or conditions. There are two primary categorizations. You have count controlled, which means you start at the beginning of the loop and you count all the way up. Um, or down, depending on what your condition is. And then Sentinel is flag controlled. You don't know the number of times you have to iterate ahead of time. For example, if you're opening a file and it doesn't have a set number of items in the file, you might have to wait until you hit the end of file character. Otherwise, you might tell the user, you know, keep entering numbers, and if you enter, if you enter a negative, I'll break out. Well, that's not count controlled, because that would be um, if it said enter 10 numbers, so it knows exactly ahead of time how many. Um, or, even if you ask the user how many values are in there and they enter 10, going into the loop it knows how many values. So that would be count controlled. Sentinel controlled is not knowing ahead of time. It's based on a particular condition being met that does not rely on a counter. Okay. In C sharp, there are three primary expressions of the control of the repetition control structure. You've got the while loop and do while loops. Then you've got for loop, and then there's a variation on the for loop called the for each loop. So while and do while, while loops and do while loops, like pretty much all the languages you've dealt with, um, except for VB, which is a little bit different. But if you've had Java or C plus plus, you know that while loops are pretest which means that they test the condition before executing the block of code. So this example is, 
um, while count is less than five, do something, and then you, you move, this is a count controlled loop in this case, so it's moving toward, uh, we're assuming count starting lower than five, pro probably zero, or one, and then it counts up. So eventually this loop's going to terminate. But it does the test before it ever enters the loop. If count equals, say, 5 or 6 or 12, here, before it enters the loop, this will be false, so it will never actually execute this block of code. Do while loops are very similar, but they're a post test. So they're a little, they're the reckless uh, black sheep of the family. They basically execute the block of code and then ask questions. So they test the code afterwards. Therefore, they are guaranteed to execute at least once. So a do while loop, even if this um, condition is false going into the loop, it will execute whatever's in this loop once at least. So that's the difference between while and do while. For loops are uh, perfect for count controlled or counter controlled loops uh, looping. They have the counter built into the heading so you don't forget it. A lot of times in while loops you might get an infinite loop that will keep on going forever because you forget to move the counter toward the um, termination condition, but in for loops they put everything in the heading. So you've got the initialization right here. You can initialize it or even declare it and initialize it. Then you have a semicolon that separates it from the middle condition, which is the actual loop termination condition, or loop continuation condition, so it's going to keep continuing until it meets um, that, that statement right there, as long or, well, until, it, until that statement is false. So this is the loop continuation statement or condition, and then since we started at zero and our loop um, termination occurs at, uh, you know, as long as x is less than 10, so that means if x is 10, that's our termination condition, so we want to move the x, starting at zero, toward the 10, so this eventually terminates. So then you do something each iteration. You don't have to worry about the counter inside the body. That's taken care of at the in the heading. OK, so we've covered data types and variables and control structures. I already mentioned methods and event handlers, but as a formal treatment, we'll look at that real briefly. Um, you've got the uh, methods and event handlers. Methods are just named repeatable blocks of code that can be called or invoked when they need to be used. These promote code reuse, which is a good software engineering technique. Event handlers are methods, okay, as we saw with our little button example here. This is a method, but it's wired in so that it's associated with this button here. Now, the, if you're wondering where is the code where it's wired in, well, you'd have to look under the Solution Explorer outside the, it's kind of outside the um, coverage of the class, but if you look at the code that the uh, Visual Studio generated for you, you'll notice that it creates an event handler automatically here. So you've got the click event that is part of the button, that's one of its properties, um, and then you add the event handlers right here, and this is how you do it. You say new system event handler, and then you pass it the name of the actual event handler. So this is called wiring, okay, event handler wiring. But that's kind of outside the realm of what we need to be talking about, so we're not going to cover that in depth, especially right now. So this is the um, method here. It's the uh, event handler uh, named uh, BTN click me. Usually it generates it automatically with the name of the, or it will generate it automatically with the name of the button, which is BTN click me underscore, and then it's going to put the name of the event which is being handled, click. So all this math is being done, this part's done sequentially, then it branches off and does this. Um, you could obviously have the user input values with a text box or all kinds of different things. We'll see that as, as time goes on. But event handlers are special methods that are executed when a particular event occurs. So for example, such as when a user clicks a button, the user starts typing, a timer hits a certain point, um, um, user, the something changes an image, uh, anything. Okay, it could be a ton of different stuff. There's tons and tons of events. Here's an example of an event handler. Um, we already did this, so I'm not going to belabor it, but if you want to practice on your own, this is how you do it. Create a new Windows Forms application, drag the button onto the form, double click the button. I would recommend changing its name um, and text properties so that there's something useful. Um, and then finally, in this particular section, we're just going to talk about arrays briefly. There are different 
containers, but let's talk about arrays. An array is a named collection of items of the same type, so we call them homogeneous, okay, or homogeneous, depending on who pronounces it. And um, they're accessed by their index, so you have a single variable name, which is the name of the array, and each of the individual components of the array, or the values that you store in the array, are accessed by their index. Okay, you can think of the array variable itself as the apartment building, and you can think of the indices, or each index, as an apartment. Okay, so if you have the apartment building named Cherry Hill, um, and then you live in apartment 333, then the index would be 333. Um, we count indices from 0 in C sharp, just like um, Java, C++, etc. This is how you declare and define an array though in C sharp. It's a little bit different syntax than you might be used to in some languages. So you have the data type, you put the brackets here so it knows it's an array and not just a regular old um, integer, because if you don't put the brackets here it's going to think, oh that's an integer named my ARR. If you put the brackets here it says, oh it's an array. Then at some point you have to say equals new int same data type as the declaration, as an int, and then in brackets over on this side you put the number of elements in the array. So in this case um, it's size 6. Now be careful here because that is not the highest um, index. If you're familiar with Visual Basic, when you pass, when you create an array, it's the upper bound. Okay, it would be the value here, but that's not the case with C Sharp or Java or C++. This right here indicates that that is the number of elements. So that means that the highest index is one less than the number of elements because we count from zero. So you can uh, valid indices include zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that is um, six indices if you count them one by one. So zero is the first index, one is the second, uh, two is the third, three is the fourth, four is the fifth. Um, five is the sixth, so that is six indices, but you cannot use six as an index. Does that make sense? Um, so ponder that for a minute if you have to get your wrap your mind around it. Good thing about having online courses is you can pause me and think about stuff. Um, so the for loop would work like this. Notice I'm explicitly restraining j to less than six because if I say less than or equal to six, it's going to go out of bounds and crash. Okay, so you can try it on your own and see how it will crash. But this is a for loop here. It's filling the array with values. It's just taking the index times 2. So my array at 0 is going to equal 0 times 2. That's 0. My array at 1 is going to be 1 times 2. That's 2. My array at 2 is equal to 2 times 2. That's 4. So it's basically like a again an apartment building. And in each of the apartments you're stuffing information. So in summary there's a whole lot more that you could learn about C Sharp. Um, this should get you started though. We will cover more topics that are C Sharp related as they come up. Um, this is enough for now to get your feet wet with ASP.NET, which we will do next lecture. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at jpbaugh at oaklandcc.edu and I will uh, see, you, uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye.